The Earnestly Speaking Podcast is a show that is founded on free-flowing conversation and may at times venture into mature subjects. Listener discretion is advised. First Speaker Podcast coming to you on August 11, 2020 on a Hot as fuck today. On the line, old friend of pot, of course, Kyle F. And Nash. Through the game. Talk of some stuff. Social security, Dick. See, 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 you're one of these cats that keeps talking about the weather when they get started. Nobody gives a damn how hot it is here. They're just glad it's not snowing. I rather, right now, I'd rather be snowing right now, to be honest with you. I'd rather be winter time. I was, I was on the wife earlier today. I'm, I'm, I'm done with this, uh, this summer, you know, bullshit. I'm done. Well, you know, uh, well, see, here's the thing. I, I was I, I was born of the heat, so I notice it's there, but it bothers me less. It bothers me more in this day and age, and, you know, I can't walk with a 15-month or, what, what is it, 15-month-old, yeah, right, mm-hmm. I guess? For, for you, uh, right? Yeah, for you, 15 months, 14 months, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's coming up on month 15 is how I'll put it, yeah. Right. So, like, you know, he can't be in 100-degree heat. That's that's not a good plan. Right. Or at least not for an extended period of time. Anyway, uh, we got a lot to talk about. Before we get started, um, you got a new gig now. What's going on with that? Yes, yeah, right. I am I have I have joined uh, uh, the three-point conversion. Shouts to, of course, Controversy Raphael. Many others we already know, right? L.A. brought us the General Mike Patton, et cetera. You know, long list O names. Danny Thompson, DT, of course, with whom I do Beyond the Buzzer. Um, you know, it's it's something that's kind of I, 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 it's something that's kind of been brewing, but never really fell in the right timing. And um, then it did. You know, uh, Blue HQ, of course. You know, um, uh, it's unfortunately it went under. But um, oh wow, yeah. Like, well, and here's what's creepy: it was the very day after I uh, put in that I was going to transition. Um, the site was shut down, but, um, you know, look for Dalton Tinklenberg to continue to do his work, um, as he's, uh, developing his, his, uh, new venture, the Scouting Depot. Um, so yeah, it's not that Blue HQ was gone as far as Dalton Tinklenberg is concerned. It's just a new life where he's going to focus more on scouting and draft stuff. And hey, listen, uh, he's not a bad mind when it comes to that. So, uh, right. you know, give him a shout when he gets going. Three count, three count guys are cool, man. I mean, we've, we've known Raphael for quite a while. Um, obviously, you mentioned yeah. names, Mike Patton and uh, Ellie Broadus and whatnot. Good, good crew of people there, definitely. DT, of course. The fraud oh, con, yeah. the fraud con uh, enthusiast. The fraud con fan queen. Yeah, look, listen, man. I mean, you got problems when you're trying to tell me that Matt Ryan is the first ballot Hall of Famer. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Oh yeah, that's that's crazy. Yeah, you know. Uh, and then all their unpopular opinions and hot takes, hot take Yes. Know? Well, it's, it was my debut article to get, jump in with the unpopular opinions. The joke I made there, of course, is, is one of, of DT's. And like I said, he may be my ally and partner and be on the buzzer, but he's not above the law. That's a bad take. And I've said, to, so I've said so to him on his show. So there mm-hmm. you go. But um, my debut uh, piece is, I would encourage you to read it. Last week's unpopular opinions. This week's will be coming up pretty soon. But in there, I talk about uh, um, and, and support my unpopular opinion, one of several in there that were real good. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, credit to uh, Damien Adams, actually, somebody who had another strong uh, unpopular opinion that wasn't just a hot take, I think. If, 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 you, if you are of any age and remember Mike Tyson um, and his prowess, it would be very interesting to read his take. But that one you're going to have to read. Me, me I, I again come back, we, we've had this discussion about how the 2019 NFL MVP is not Lamar Jackson. Um, But I think what you would appreciate in in the tradition of the Earnestly Speaking pod, those truly great ones get three names. And when uh, I made a point in there, something like the reason why he's not the MVP, Russell Carrington Wilson. (laughs) The man. (laughs) Which, by the way, has – yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the three-point staff encouraged, it, or not encouraged, rather, but, but appreciated it as well. I had to make sure you got your credit therein. I like it. Russell yeah. Camille Wilson. <laughs> I, 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 but I, got, I got to credit Raph, too. He's He's been on the on a Wilson bandwagon for a long time. 
Right. You just like, can't accept the fact that he's a game manager. And, and I mean, you know, just because he's good at his job doesn't mean he can't ever be wrong. Um, and we'll leave it at that. Well, you know, we've had some battles over the years about Russell Wilson and all that. We'll just, you know, leave it as it is. And you've, you've come a long way from with, with the Wilson's narratives. You know, I haven't come a long way. He's come a long way. He actually learned to be a much better passer. Yeah, he's really good. He has the best deep ball in football, in my opinion. Um, so. I, we, I, I'm not going to battle you on that. No, it's not like you trying to tell me that, that Brady's the goat with your uneducated self. <laughs> there we go again. <laughs> Why are you so salty, Kyle? Why are you so salty? I'm not salty. Uh, you know what? You know what makes me salty? What? Ignorant ass opinions that prevail as fact. And that is not one. Well, There's I... people out there that want to, that want to talk about how great Brett Favre is and not even whisper Joe Montana's name. Well, you're an idiot. That's not, that ain't me. You ain't know. You and I, we, we stand, no, no, we hold hands on the Brett Favre narrative. Because, you and I hold hands yeah. on the Brett Favre narrative. Believe me. We are on the same page on that one. He's not top 10 for me. This is, this is, this is cool for what it is. Um, you know, I, I'm really hoping we get football this year because obviously I missed this banter, but unfortunately, at least on the college end, we're definitely on the way not having that. Um, today, they announced, the Big Ten announced that they are canceling the fall season um, mm-hmm. in, in, in hopes to uh, to launch in the spring. Um, and the same goes for the Pac-12 as well, announcing today. Now, we just heard about two hours ago before I came on the, came on the air here that uh, the Big 12 is going to power through and try to salvage a season this year. Of course, I don't see how that's, how that's going to happen because, I don't know, it feels like the trends are, gonna, are just there that, we're going to have, uh, at least right now, no college football. Where, where are you on this? I mean, you I, I think you and I, the last time on the podcast, we, we did on July 14th, we, we were giving up percentage of chances of this not happening. And then we, we, you and I were pretty high. I think it went higher than you on point. You were still optimistic to some degree on some of the things that could ha- could work out. But now we have, again, Big Ten, no go. Pac-12, no go. Big 12, right. for now, going, but who knows? Yeah, the Big Ten, the Big Ten dropping was a big domino for me. That that's like, all right, this is a whole problem. Like, but first of all, I think we're pretty sure that the SEC, if 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 college football is going to be entirely canceled, that the SEC will be the final domino to drop. There's no question. And at this point already, too, there's a number of other conferences that are stepping in. Right, the Sun Belt has said publicly, for example, a smaller conference, by the way, you know, that it will go as the SEC goes, which is interesting. Um, you know, the MAC being canceled is one thing. Conference USA and the American are, are pretty quiet at the moment. I mentioned the American, of course, because I cover UCF, so I don't know what my life's going to look like as a college media member at the moment. Right. Um, and uh, I find it interesting that two conferences that have what was it deemed the one time the most prolific COVID state in the union, of course, being Florida, both the ACC and the SEC, so this time scheduling football. I, I think the SEC will be the last conference to to make its decision to do this. I think you know right. for, for all the talk about the, you know people in the SEC to make the decision. I think the SEC is going to be going to wait to the very 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 end, you know, to use every every angle possible because obviously they make so much money on 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 sports in general, especially football, and they are obviously the top conference, the most popular conference, you know, the South and all that. You know, all you know, all the narratives around that. You know, we have to go through that. So, but I think they're gonna be the very last one. I, th- I think, I, I again, I I am a, a, in the camp still, even more so now than I was a month ago. No college ball this year, that, without question. And I think SEC will be the last year to drop. Well, if that's gonna happen, that decision has to come down, and I'll say the next two weeks or so. Got to be. And to be honest, if all of it, if all of it gets canceled. Yeah. You know, I really don't like the chances of spring ball happening from a logistics standpoint. Why? And we'll leave, it, we'll leave out the part where we're not even sure about COVID and its prowess and how it will still remain. I mean, we, can we guarantee we'll have a vaccine by then? I'm pretty sure we can't, you know. So right. that's a whole other conversation. But there's a, a whole other logistical thing. Like, we call it spring, but if you're talking spring semester, that means it's starting in January. You know, that's not a thing. And and you know what 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 are, you, are are they expecting these cats to start taking snaps in like what February or March? You know, in other words, half their season these kids won't even be students. What are you going to do about eligibility and these sorts of issues like that? I mean, you know, if you're certain schools, you put them in like classes like Swahili or something, well, they'll get a you know a, a, a floater A. <laughs> Swahili. But, you know, 
that's why. You know, I, I'm not joking. That, that's a thing that happened at the right. University of North Carolina. So before anybody tries, you know, why did you pick Swahili and be all racist, Kyle? No, that was the class they used. Check out Real Sports. They did a story on it a number of years back. So, I mean, it's far enough back to where I was still the student of the game. I can tell you that, which would have been 2016. So, Right, right. Now, um, how do you – like, it, it is a shame, though, that unfortunately – even the narratives around this has to be politicized. Like I, 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 I I'm not calling you names. Obviously, I'm done doing that. I've been doing that for the last fucking like couple of weeks now. You know, this idea that there is members of the sports media that does not want college football to happen, or sports to happen for that matter, and people pushing that narrative. You know, when in fact, I think that's a straw man. I don't think that ever happened, EJ. I, I, I got to be clear. I think that's a straw. There, man. there are some. There, no, no, there are some. Folks in the media that are claiming this, Clay Travis, Jason Whitlock, you know, for starters, a lot, a lot, a lot of, uh, I, I don't want to bring up the whole right wing thing, but there's a lot of right wing leaning people who do bring up those, those narratives and make, and make it a thing. And people follow. No, it. no, I, I understand that there are narratives and listen, I, I feel, I feel ways about Clay Travis and Jason Whitlock both. I, I find there, I find that there are narratives they choose to be a, 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 as clickbaity as, let's say, as clickbaity as there is snow in a blizzard. You right. Know, mm -hmm. But but um, but they don't need to, to, to be smart. And, and that's what fr frustrates me about those two in particular. But I say all that to say this. They can they can tout that all they want. What I'm trying to tell you, EJ Christian, mm -hmm. is that it is a straw man. I, I do not believe there are members of the sports media that don't want college football to happen. Because you don't gain. I mean, Christ, DJ, let's take my myself, by the way, who's still building and not making a big paycheck off of it yet, okay? Right. I was in position now, but part of what, what, what we were trying for, but we had the three-point conversion, was to break in with the NFL and get season credentials to the Jags. Then I'd have the premier group of five team and an NFL squad season credentials on my belt, and I would be able to build myself up a little bit more and as well as, you know, the three-point and then, you know, all that other stuff. But now that's completely out the window. You know, uh -huh. and no. you think I'm cheering for that? No, no, that makes, and, 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 that's that's a, a, and that's the thing, though. Like, yeah, I, I don't b agree with that narrative that there are people doing that. They're, they're, they're saying that yeah. there are folks in the media who don't want sports to happen. That's ludicrous. No sports, no job. Right. Oh, and, and I'll put it this way: like, you know, whoever they are, point this to them so they can explain why. Maybe they got a point. Listen, it happens with Clay Travis and Jason Whitlock both. For all the flack they get, there are times where they are the sole voices of reason as well. It happens. No, no, no I agree. I, I, I follow the work, yeah. too. So, yeah. That, that was more for the listeners at home than you. I, I'm aware of right. how you follow Clay Travis's work mm -hmm. and, and, and people who aren't as, how you say, conservative as Clay Travis. I, I don't know why the hell somebody's political leaning matters in sports, but that's a whole other question. We are talking about a world where at one point, at least 10 years ago, ESPN hired Rush Limbaugh to help on their damn sports analysis. So, or no, excuse me, was that Fox either? No, it was ESPN. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, once, once upon a time, we're talking about the same world that brought Dennis Miller into the Monday Night Booth. Okay. Yeah. Oh, once, once upon a time, I, I lived in an era where like I didn't make friends based off their political leanings. Oh, like, hey, uh, my name's Ernest. Honest to meet you. Oh, uh, by the way, what, what? How do you vote? What's your political? Uh, what, what do you register as? I mean, that's not, that doesn't. I mean, th this is this is weird to me. Like the fact, that, and people are so open about the, about the political leanings now. Like it's yeah. I, I, and, 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 and by the way, that's okay. We will do that. I mean, it's free speech, but. It's just weird to me. Like, I don't base my friends on that. That's just weird yeah, shit. Yeah, exactly. No, that's ridiculous. I'm much more likely to kick your dumb ass to the curb because you're such a Brady humper. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yet you haven't, though. Yet you haven't. It's weird, right? You say that, but yet you haven't. You know? <laughs> I mean, I, you see, I, I think there's hope in you, EJ Christian. I think you could see the light. I mean, there's hope, why else yes. would you claim to be a Giants fan if you weren't trying to somehow repress your Brady love? <laughs> hey man, I, I respect the guy. What can I tell you, man? There, there are you. times. There, there are times where I, I even think I get really creative with this shtick. I got to tell you, that was a pretty good one by mm -hmm. me. <laughs> so, when, <laughs> so when we did the podcast back about back in July, um, I think I said I was eighty percent yes, sure. Don't, don't, months, I should feel privileged. Right? You should. You should. The only person who's been on a podcast like on a weekly basis is, is Mark Francois, and that's because of politics. 
Well, well, election, it's election you know year. What? Mark Francois is good people. I'm going to be paying, looking forward to that pod, too. I mean, I'm not 100% in lockstep with him, but he's never said something where I'm just like, okay, stop it, yes, JW. Well, it'll, it'll, well it'll, be on this, it'll be on this exact episode, so don't don't feel – trust me, you got to share the marquee. So. <laughs> wait, I got to I gotta, – wait, do I have to – do, do, do I have to lead into him? Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I, so, so he, he'll, he'll be okay, <laughs> buddy. I promise. By the way, he uh, sent me. I told him I was starting, I was recording with you first when I got to him. He sent me a text saying, um, "Tell Mr. Nash to send him hugs and kisses." I mean, hugs are cool, but he's going to need a step ladder for the kisses, unless he's into something else that I don't know about. Oh boy, seven five, Mr. Nash. <laughs> <laughs> So when we did the pod about a month ago, I, you know, we had given up percentage of chance. I, I believe that's an eighty percent uh, chance no college football at the time. I think you went to sixty five percent. I think. I, I I was still I was still yeah I was still closer to fifty fifty. My, my would what, you say sixty five? Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, I think you said yeah, 80, that. eighty eighty at that time. I just thought yeah I, I thought you were out of your gourd. Yeah. And here we are. I mean shit. And but now we have we have two conferences right now. that so not, not doing it. One is is going like to power through two for now. Two five conf- conferences. Yeah, like I mean, of course the Earth moved when UConn declared that they would cancel their program. <laughs> we had a fun time with that, G. Leo and I, and talking about how much we don't care. I didn't. I didn't finish but, watching that. I saw. I saw you guys. He was on your uh, on your on your show the other day. Yes, he, he stepped in for uh, Danny Thompson when he was on assignment. Is that is that show actually podcastable outside of a video? It is. Um, we are uh, we are in the works for that. There there are there are plans to move that over with the three point conversions, iHeart account, among other things. Okay. What's the audio version? Because I can't catch it on Facebook. I at least listen to it on headphones. You know. Oh hey man, I mean you could always catch catch in, catch up to it after the fact on there too. I mean Crane, you do need headphones. I, I appreciate that. But you're a pod guy too. I, oh, I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I'm an audio file. You know that. I mean, I'm, I'm not against yeah. videos. I'm just saying I'm I'm definitely an audio guy though. Hey, some of our best moments were on video, you and I, you know, when we did the cam swag salute together. It was great. Yes, that was 2015. Hey, guys, this is this podcast. It's actually on my my, uh, my YouTube page. So since you're such a Patriots fan, does that mean, like, cam swag is your side thing now? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I, I try to get rid of the Patriots. I'm like, oh, they're going to fall apart. I'm going to be so happy. And all of a sudden, cam goes to fucking New England. Like, like oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I can't quit you guys, man. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> Why can't I quit you? Would you be hate? Would you be Heath Ledger or Jake Gyllenhaal? Oh, we, we we're not doing that. We're not doing that. Well, <laughs> who's who's still alive? Gyllenhaal's still alive, right? So, ooh, no, don't ooh, do that. Ooh, too soon. No, <laughs> it's too, not, way, way too soon. Too it'll never be. It'll never be uh, not too soon enough. Um, speaking of NFL, um, with all the news about college football, and you know, obviously our our stance on this, on what, whether or not have a season or not, like I've maintained saying that while we'll have a we'll have a college football season, my position on the NFL is that we'll have at least a semblance of the season because I think the economics, I think commerce will, on both ends especially, not just on, on the owner's side, but even the players want, a lot of players want to still do, push through. I think that will dictate I mean, yeah. something. So my prediction is we'll get, we'll get at least a month of football. Um, yeah, I think that's strong. It's, it's probably got more to do with the play, uh, players wanting to play than anything else, right? Yes. I yes. mean, but, you know, Give, give the NFL their credit where they have a, the opt-out program just like the college players do. And by the way, before anyone asks, just so you know, if a, if a student athlete opts out with a scholarship, they maintain their scholarship. They don't lose that. They may lose their spot if they get beat out by an incoming freshman or something like that, but mm-hmm. that's a whole other conversation. Right. But um, what I will say is, you know, you're right with the commerce aspect, you know, and, and – Excuse me. I think in the case of the NFL, there's a tra- there's a lot less travel overall, right? And and, and th- it being the NFL, they're tra- traveling in a lot better style, or you know, uh, they have a lot um, a lot better accommodation therein because you're dealing in more money. Not every college program is turning to profit, Ernest Chris, and be clear about that. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're Russell, if you're Russell Cantankerous Wilson with your pregnant girl Sierra there with you. You're not going to be riding in some bus crowded with a bunch of other kids. No, you're going to be flying in style. You know, uh, your biggest problem might be if, you know, your center wants to sit next to you on this flight and that's not practical. That, that kind of thing. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, actually, well, in the case of uh, Seattle's um, offensive line, there wouldn't be much room taken up because they don't really exist. <clears throat> but anyway, <Yes. laughs> uh, no. So, 
it's yeah, you're right with the commerce piece. Um, you know, and people want to liken the NFL to baseball because they're not in a bubble, and, and they need to pump the brakes on that, right? You know, right. We're, we're talking 30 games, 30 teams, road games, I should say, 60 overall. That's more attention than I ever want to pay to baseball. So just be glad you got that. Under we're, still, we're still on that, but, right? We're still on that to the baseball thing. No yeah. good. But, but, yeah, that was that was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but, um, yeah. 30, 30 teams, 30 road games, that's 900 instances of roadies out there, okay? And in the case of baseball players, they're there for a, a, a stretch of time, for a series, a, a, you know, for, for yeah, for a series to, to play a number of games. That means they're lingering at the destination for a number of nights. These cats are looking for things to do. I'm not necessarily saying that they're, you know, going to stop off at Magic City and get some wings, but you know, they're going to look for things to do. I hope you got that. Uh, anyway. uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally got that. Believe me. I know you did, but that was more for the listeners at home again. Yeah. But uh, to put it this way, Chief, NFL players, they don't, they're on a much more rigid schedule than that. Now, I'm not here to tell you there's no risk at all because that would be stupid. But don't compare it to the MLB. It's, it's not comparable. You know, all you got to do is, is test them. Bef- uh, you know, shortly before travel, when they're positive, they don't go on the trip. Right. Okay. Just before you leave, test again. And then when they arrive, test again. May the force be with you. You know, and again, <laughs> you're going to have instances, you're going to have instances of people that come up with COVID. You know, uh, I mean, th- heck, people were thinking, were, were thinking that the NBA was going to be disaster because all the stuff that popped up just before the bubble began. But now look where we are. How many weeks has it been before the NBA or since the NBA has even reported a positive case of any sort? About and months. now we're talking yeah. about, yeah, we're talking about great playoff, or well, I shouldn't say playoff, but set up to the playoffs. Portland and Phoenix are playing out of their butts in a way that no one expected. Joel Embiid's being hurt and stopping the Sixers from being successful. That, that's nothing new. But you see what I'm getting? <laughs> yeah, I'm totally getting Yeah, absolutely. And, and Orlando's hurts are broken again because Jonathan Isaac got hurt. That's it. So, I mean, there's some things that are different that you, are, that you expected, but there are some things that are different that are amazing. We'll leave that at that. Have you been watching the NBA? Have you watching the uh, summer games? <clears throat> Not as much as I would like because um, I'm, I, I cut the court at my house, so getting in front of an NBA game is still difficult. Mm-hmm. I know we, there's league pass there for the uh, up, to, uh, up to the end of the year or whatever, um, so that's been the opportunity to catch one or two. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, by the way, last I heard, there was a five-period freaking hockey game going on, so there's that. <laughs> wow. But, um, yeah, uh, but there you go. I'm, I, I've been trying to keep up with it. I've been getting better with it. I've been making – intelligent points that uh, Danny Thompson cannot refute at this time on Beyond the Buzzer. So that's a good thing. Get him. Get him. <laughs> um, last thing let you go. Last thing. Um, last week, uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson actually purchased the XFL for a mere $15 million. Him and his uh, investing group, which includes his ex-wife, uh, Danny Garcia. Um, which, by the way, very, you know, this is not very normal, obviously, that you get along with XY to the point where you're actually also a financial, you know, partner as well. But they make it work, man. Dwayne Johnson is in his ex, and they, you know, they have their own lives now. Still, they have their own uh, spouses on uh, now, and it's very, very interesting stuff. But they purchased the XFL for fifty million dollars. Are we going to see hey, football, uh, a street football again? Another attempt? You think? You know, I, I'd be very frustrated if if the XFL was kept alive where the AAF wasn't. And call me call me biased if you want, mm-hmm. but the Apollos, uh, you know, was a fun time covering those games. You know, I I actually know one of the play, one of the former starters personally, Aaron Evans, mm-hmm. former uh, UCF slash Eagle, you know, uh, tackle, also played for the uh, Apollos, and his original painting sitting above my head, you know. So, mm-hmm. uh, I'm biased there, but like now that 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 Tampa team, who has that team, shouldn't survive. They weren't they weren't good, and they weren't drawing. What? No. Anyways, um, that being said, I mean you got to give the Rock credit for for finding the opportunity to find this league at salvage value, right? You know. Uh, obviously he's in good with, in good with Vince McMahon, you know, uh-huh. but 
I heard I heard Lavar Arrington say this on the radio on this past Sunday, as a matter of fact, that if they did a reboot of uh, a, a live action reboot of Thundercats and they picked The Rock to play Lionel, his uh, what he would take home from doing that movie would you know pay for the XFL and then some. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> do you think? Do you think though that? Uh... You know, obviously, Prince is a, a very di- a dying asset. Um, it's always smart if, if you know he can use it to some degree. Um, I mean, Expo was actually doing fairly decent prior to COVID. Meh. No, I mean, not really. I mean, the ratings. I'm talking about the ratings. So that, they, they were solid. They weren't great, but they were solid. They weren't in, in, in the tank. I don't think they were doing any better than the AAF was. Right. You know? And, and if, if we're going to say the AAF wasn't successful, then we can't say this is either. But you can know? we that argue the said, AAF though was more like more of a, they shot themselves in the foot by, 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 by with the financials not being in order? Um, well, there was a lot of, there was a lot of um, shady that took place. I don't think it was so far as bad play, planning as there was some corruption and shenanigans that, that went down. Um, but, I'll say this. Here, here's the one way I think that the XFL is viable. Is if you've seen any of these, I don't know what you call them, statements or, or, or lists of demands from players in certain conferences surrounding playing under COVID-19 and this and that and the other thing. And like all of them make demands of some sort that are just a bridge too far. Like, no, you should not be paid to play. Now, you want to make money off your likeness, you go for it. The instant you're paid to play, you've just obliterated college sport, not just football. But, you know, stuff like that is going to come up. But if anything, I think the NFL is kind of in that position where they have to keep that one eye open to find an option to have that minor league. And that's what the AAF was trying to become. That's what the XFL was trying to become. But so long as the college system exists, the NFL has no motivation to go there. We talked about this on the Beyond the Buzzer, Danny uh, Thompson and I. And and I think, you know, as we could talk about they have to be prepared to fill roster spots immediately. We could talk about that till we're blue in the face. But until there's no longer a free option to do that in the form of a college farm system like we have now, there's not going to be any opportunity where the NFL sponsors or, or fiscally backs a league. Now, if that league... XFL or whoever it would be, finds themselves a way to become fiscally viable to where they would actually make money for the league and not just be a place where they, you know, park some players as if they're going to some Shaolin temple to learn Kung Fu or something, you know, then they have a fighting chance. Um, But that's a whole other concept that I said that as if it's easy and it ain't, simply put. Fair point. Fair point. I like how you explain that. Anyway, Kyle, it was fun. Short, easy, to the point. Hmm, sounds like your social life. Honestly, you're not wrong there. <laughs> you're not wrong there, dude. <laughs> Although it's been cool. Like I've been able to go out the last couple Fridays with some friends from work and just kind of have like a die time, if you will. You know, I don't get that anymore. Listen, you know? so long as you wear your damn mask, I don't care. Oh, yeah. Of course I do. You mean, I mean you're in South Florida, bro? You can't be that dumb. No, I'm not. That's stupid. That's stupid. And, and believe me, even even in in the bar, or whatever, we're, we're social distancing, definitely. So nice, you know. So you know, wear your damn mask, guys. Um. So other than three count, you anything else you want to plug? Not three yeah, count. Um, uh, three, three, uh, 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 not three count. Uh, what did I say? Um, um, three point conversion. Should I say? I, I got to do a three count and three point now. So there you go. Yeah, uh, all boy, James Neese. You have all these trinities in your life, yes. When, when's the last time you watched The Matrix? Anyway, <laughs> no, man. Yeah, years. Obviously, we talked about the three-point conversion beyond the buzzer. Um, I've been getting deeper into politics locally here for me than I think you're really? aware. I've interviewed the Orange County mayor, um, uh, Jerry Demings, a couple times regarding COVID, and we had a candidate for um, Orange County and Volusia County judge uh, Christy Collins, who was a fantastic uh, time. I, I would vote for her if she were in my county, but she is not. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but yeah, so, you know, doing some things there. And of course, that's with the Captain and Company morning show with Captain Chris Hill uh, fly, or piloting the flight deck there. And <laughs> hilarity by default, we went to a live stream on YouTube. I don't know if you're aware of that, but that's a thing we did. But no, we can still that. also come out with recorded episodes as well. All right. All right. 
See, he's a busy guy, man. These days, even through COVID, still busy. It's good. Hey, man. You know, I, I just, well, see. Obviously, I wanted, I wanted to, to to not have college football this year, so I had more time to focus on Demos trying to explain to me how Rogue One isn't the best Star Wars movie. Whatever. Rogue One was good. So Rogue One, Rogue One was surprisingly good. But I will say, I will say this much though, that. It was probably really good because it was it had very low expectations. Well, I mean, I don't. I, it wasn't like it was so low, and everybody wanted thought it was going to be right. crap out of the gate. But I digress. Well, it was a mess anyway, too. With the, with the, with the you know, they had to fire the director and a new director in there. And it, was, it, was, it was really a mess, even going, even before it was even completed. So the fact that Solo came out being as good as it was is a small miracle. For, forget about the financials for a minute. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the, some of the bad choices they made were the reason why the financials were bad. You still got a pretty decent move at, movie out of it, but mm-hmm. you know, my biggest issue was what they did uh, at the end, which I can't measure because it's a spoiler. But somebody pops up who just has no business in this movie. None. My wife hates the Red Skywalker, though she can't stand it. Oh, oh, that, no! It was a pretty bad movie. She's right. Yeah. Her her thing was, this was her theory, her and her, her brother, my brother-in-law, was, uh, like, if you like Last Jedi, you hated Rise of Skywalker. If you hated uh, Last Jedi, you love Rise of Skywalker. Is that accurate? No, they're, they're both pretty goddamn bad. I didn't mind Last Jedi, to be honest with you. I didn't hate it. I, didn't, I, I mean, um, the For- Force Awakens was obviously the best of the three, but sure. I, I didn't hate Last Jedi. I didn't hate it as much as people did. I, I thought it was absolutely awful. Oh, and not wow. just because they were heavy, heavy-handedly trying to tell me how bad a human being I am. Like, it was just not a good movie. I'll tell you what. Let's sidebar that for the next time we go on the podcast. I want to discuss that with you a little bit. Copy that. Okay. Kyle, we'll talk soon, buddy. Hey, man. Looking forward to it. Glad to uh, walk you through The Last Jedi when you're ready for it. As a member of Hilarity by Default, that'll be a good time. Man, <laughs> hey, listen. Until next time, class is made. <laughs> All right. On the line, of course, again this week, <laughs> Mark Francois. With us, Mark. Uh, it's like weekly now we're going now, I guess, huh? Well, you know, we're, uh, what is it, 84 days from Election Day? Some day 1300 shit. 1300 of the uh, Trump administration. So uh, oh. shit's going to get faster and furiouser and a whole lot more interesting with it, with each passing day. Well, we did, we did say that as once. It, as it did today. Yeah, we, we did say also, too, that. If if the VP gets selected immediately, we're going to emergency pop this thing. So that's what we're doing. Uh, Joe Biden so finally here we are. Joe so Biden sound the alarm. Sound the alarm. Yeah, it's it's official now. It's now it's now officially a race. Uh, Joe Biden has play, selected. Yeah, Kamala, play the Kamala. old like ABC News breaking uh, breaking news or uh, ABC World News tonight like trumpet music like. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, that's that's, that's uh, ABC News on twenty twenty two sometimes. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah. But, uh, sorry, go on. Yeah, Kamala Harris is the VP uh, running mate for Joe Biden. Uh, you were uh, obviously a big Kamala, Kamala Harris supporter last year um, during the primaries, sure. um, so you should be pretty excited about this. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about this. I think it's a really big moment um, for, for the country. It's only the second time um, – yeah, or excuse me, it's the third time ever that a woman – has been nominated uh, for the for the vice presidency, and the first time either an African American or Asian woman has been nominated for the vice presidency. And I mean, as as I've said p- quite plainly on this podcast many times before, Kamala Harris was my pick to be our forty sixth president. So uh, I have absolutely no qualms with this decision whatsoever. So I'm gonna be honest with you. There's a lot of people who are kind of. Well, on social media, there's definitely a lot of mixed feelings about this, uh, about this uh, selection. Um, you know, you already know I've I've been kind of eh on Kamala, panderer that kind of thing. Um, but I will say this much though, um, I don't hate the pick. I thought that was something that was definitely being seriously thought of. I mean, certainly not vice president, but certainly an AG or general attorney general in the Biden administration. So many he wins. Um, so I'm not totally shocked necessarily that this happened. I'm not. It's the same pick, really, to be honest with you. No, no. You know, and look, some of the obvious criticisms are there. You know, uh, Bernie Bros, progressive types will try to say that the senator isn't liberal enough, isn't progressive enough. Uh, when, let me see here. I have I have the note right here as I look it up. You know, uh, she on a ranking of 
all these senators <clears throat> currently elected done by uh, GovTrack.us on a scale of one to one, one being the most uh, conservative member of the, of the Senate, Mark Meadows from Texas, uh, and the current also White House Chief of Staff, Senator Harris ranks number 100, and for reference sake, Bernie Sanders was like 96. So, you know, you're, you, you can't really make any, com- you, you can't really come at Kamala from the left. However, the Trump administration has already come out with ads sort of attacking her from the right, trying to brand her as, you know, an older version of AOC. And that is um, in bad faith on its face. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hold water. And, you know, here's the thing. She was the youngest person elected to the San Francisco DA's office. She was twice elected attorney general to the state of California, which is... Second, in the Attorney General's office in the state of California, to put it in scope for you, is roughly 7,000 attorneys, and that particular, in the California Department of Justice is second only to the United States Department of Justice in size and scope. So she was twice elected to that office and then won by 20 points her Senate race. So, you know, Kamala Harris's record has been pretty deeply vetted. The last sort of detraction I hear from her is, you know, her record as a prosecutor, you know, some of the, some of the commentary from certain members of the black community has been kind of along the lines of, you know, she's a cop, she'll stab us in the back, she'll, she'll betray us, but that really doesn't hold up with her record. Yes, she was a prosecutor. However, you know, back at a time when Republicans were still being elected governor of California, uh, Senator Harris, as a prosecutor, sought diversionary programs, opposed the death penalty famously um, for a person who had murdered a police officer, and that was used against her in, in her campaign for attorney general. So, look, like like any politician, um, there's pros and cons. However, I think that the combination of her mixed heritage, her proven record with uh, on, on the Senate Judiciary Committee and her numerous televised um, ass whoopings of Jeff Sessions, General Kelly, uh, William Barr, and Brett Kavanaugh, um, that she has a lot to stand on. And, and the last point I'll make on that is that Joy Reid was on TV on MSNBC today on, on um, The Beat with Ari Melber as well as her show. And one of the points she was making was that in her circles among the Divine Nine, among members of prominent um, black sororities and fraternities, members of the HBCU alumni community, and and black women broadly are sort of have experiencing a non-buyer's remorse on Senator Harris from the primary and are seeing this as an opportunity to help rectify that and you know, overwhelmingly, the commentary I'm seeing from prominent black congresswomen, senators, uh, um, you know, former ambassadors, journalists, attorneys, you name it, is that by selecting Senator Harris as his running mate, Joe Biden is demonstrating that he hears um, black women who are one of the most important and impactful groups in the Democratic caucus and that they're seen, which is something that they profess has has not been the case and, and can be easily proven for, you know, the last two to 400 years. So the case you made a little while ago for Paris is that she's actually more progressive than we get credit for. Absolutely. And all this time I've been saying that she's a lot more moderate than we get credit for. Like I would, my, I, the yeah. way I the way I was framing your argument with Biden picking her was that you can't use the socialism card with them now because this is a more moderate ticket than it would have been if have, if had uh, Elizabeth Warren, for example, won the uh, the uh, gotten chosen to be the vice president. Yeah, I'll, I'll privately I'll send you the GovTrack um, r- report that uh, my friend shared with me. I'll text okay. that to you so you can uh, so you can see what I'm talking about. But there's a very detailed and lengthy analysis demonstrating her commitment to progressive causes. And that has has 
you know, been shown time and time again, just in the scope of her tenure as a senator. You know, whether it was the confirmation hearings of Jeff Sessions and calling him out on his record relative to civil rights, Mm -hmm. whether it was her um, her, you know, berating and and difficult questioning of General Kelly and Kirsten Nielsen relative to child separation. Um, I personally um, attended a rally in in March in downtown L.A. against child separation. uh, Families belong together march uh, where I watched Senator Harris speak quite passionately on on the topic so and and then most most recently you know her work with uh senator cory booker from new jersey to um to enact and co-sponsor the george floyd uh uh, memorial bill to uh uh, amend police brutality as well as anti-lynching legislation and to to enshrine that in 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 the federal code so Again, you know, there it's kind of on its face. The the, the 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 criticism is obvious in that Senator Harris made her her bones as a prosecutor. However, uh, her track record over the course of her career is such that um, she's she's um, incredibly suited and qualified for this position. And you know, a Biden Harris administration stands to serve the American people a whole lot better than does a Trump Pence administration. Well, based on what you explain it too, I mean, you have both sides of the cake here. On one hand, you have her record, which you could defend of being a more, a closer left-leaning progressive than people would give her credit for. On the other hand, she can appeal to a lot of the moderates based on being a prosecutor, pro-police, all that good stuff that people who are maybe more closer to the right but don't like Donald Trump or never Trumpers or libertarians or, you know, all, the, all those folks that want Well, to and that understand. pivot is demonstrated in her record. She's done that once before in, you know, her, her tenure as the youngest, uh, youngest elected d- district attorney in San Francisco's history. She came out against the death penalty for a convicted murder of a police officer. And that position was used loudly and prominently against her in her campaign for attorney general, which initially she won by an, she, she won by a hair, you know, um, several newspapers and, and, and outlets reported that she had lost the election. Her opponent went so far as to make a uh, victory speech that later had to be retracted. Um, but you know this is uh, this is a pivot she has has successfully made in that in her tenure as attorney general she improved a lot of her relationships with um, police associations departments and unions throughout the state of California which you know I've obviously spoken loudly against police unions and and in favor of defund the police prominent uh, you know notably she has not come out in favor of defund the police yeah. Um, which, which, but, which, which now confirms that she that the Trump administration can't use that anymore. They can't use it. Yeah, but yeah. you know, I I give I give the Biden Harris campaign um, runway to amend their position on this as more information is presented to them. Mm-hmm. I have all the faith in the world that between the two of them. Uh, they would have very powerful and, and intelligent debate on this topic, but that they will be surrounded by people as smart and smarter than them uh, informing this debate. And if, you know, by next week or by November, their position changes, I will be even more ve- I will be even more vehemently supporting their campaign than I already do. I feel like the argument of defund the police is still in the favor of against and for. I feel like the, the, while the people who are for the funding is louder, I think most of this country are still against it, just on a c- civil, uh, uh, kind of like this, like a, a above water point of view, not yeah, understanding what I, it means. I, think, I, I, I would echo that both in my personal experiences, which, you know, that's a slippery slope to, to, to find yourself sliding down. Um, and, and an easy sort of vacuum and bu- information bubble to find yourself within. But, you know, sort of in my cons- very conservative community, 
it's it's a it's a fun game for a particular friend of mine to out me as a liberal in social situations <laughs> and and let me be thrown to the uh the the red wolves as it were so i would i would say that that is uh, a sentiment that is that is widely shared particularly among the conservative community and the last i looked the polling national polling suggests that americans broadly support police reform and and are more uh, readily acknowledging systemic racism uh, that is present in our con- or present in our country. However, they are not necessarily ready to embrace defunding the police, and that's fine. Um, I think the reticence of folks broadly to embrace the movement has everything to do, or has a lot to do, I should say, with the bad faith and um, disinformation riddled information that gets spun about Black Lives Matter, about police brutality, about Colin Kaepernick, about your rights camp, about, you know, a lot of the arguments surrounding this larger discussion as we covered, you know, sort of at the outset of the George Floyd protests and looting and riots and what have you, um, that, that disinformation, that bad faith, arguing that outright lying that occurs both, you know, in the White House press room as well as the Oval Office and, and on Fox News and OAN and elsewhere mm-hmm. um, is, is as damaging to the conversation and to the movement as anything. So do you expect a bump in the polls for Biden um, with this pick? Yeah. No, I mean, it can't – probably not too significant. Um because, you know, he's already showing, you know, nice gains in battleground states and what have you. Um, I don't expect that, you know, you're going to start, you're going to start to get into the territory of where shit is pretty baked in and you're, you're sort of consuming all of the consumable airspace that you can. Um, However, one of the, one of the um, tidbits that I heard on the news today surrounding the announcement was that, um, the campaigns and staffs of both Senator Harris and Vice President Biden have been saying that, you know, in a campaign that is obviously going to be conducted almost entirely digitally, virtually and o- virtually and over the airwaves, they've seen an uptick in their total social media following across all platforms to the tune of six figures mm. in, in in a matter of days. So... You know, you just you kind of got to go off of all the available information. And it seems to me that, you know, when you just forget the politics, forget the, you know, sort of the issue box checking, when you just look at the raw sports of, say, a Harris versus Pence debate, you got to think that the uh, vice president is, is screaming for his mother slash wife and a glass of warm milk. Because um, Auntie Kamala finna hand him that ass when they when they meet on the debate stage. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I, my only concern about the debate stage going forward is that you know, because you know that the GOP is going to do this. They're going to they're, they're going to attack her record with with minorities in you know as a prosecutor. And how how, how would you get sure. that? They're going to they're going to they're going to so discord. It's the whole it's the whole thing. It, it goes in the same bucket as promoting Kanye as a third party candidate. That's you know, it's that so. sort of bad, bad faith appealing to the lowest common denominator of of you know political viewer. Mm-hmm. You know, sort of the the diamond and diamonds and silks of the of, of the community to, to to again sow discord. And I think you know one of the things that people talked about during the course of the Veep stakes was that did, you know did Kamala Harris do herself a disservice? in the way that she went after Vice President Biden in the first uh, primary debate when she attacked him on busing and, and his record on, on, on civil rights and, and black equality. And, you know, to, to other, you know, prominent black Americans and people who are in much more um, prestigious positions than myself were saying is that, you know, that, that demonstrates something that we've sort of um, – that we should be appreciating in this in this administration in that, you know, a person at the top of the ticket, a person who stands to hold the Oval Office 
doesn't um, quell dissent, but rather invites it. Right. They want to be challenged. They want to be yelled at. They want to be gathered when they're when their when their behavior is problematic. Yeah, that, that's, that, that should be a I positive. Think, that should be, in my opinion, that should be a positive thing. Anything. Absolutely, it should. And I think there are, you know, Pre- Vice President Biden is somebody who, like many white Americans who have been welcomed by the black community, I'll include people like Bill Clinton in that. Um, you know, th- th- there can be a, a a dangerous tendency to get a little too comfortable with your language. Mm-hmm. And with the manner in which you speak about civil rights. And As we explained last week on the podcast, <laughs> last week you and I. Yeah. That. Yep. You know, and I think there are few people in this country, in this discourse, better suited than Senator Harris and the people that she surrounds herself with, like Karine Jean-Pierre, mm-hmm. her chief of staff, um, to to check the vice president when he wanders into problematic waters and when his caucasity becomes a problem and, and, suck his and shot you know, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I mean, look, there, I, I, I mean, we can laugh about it and, and make jokes about it and, you know, be reductive about it, but that's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah, it really is some shot collar, man. <laughs> I mean, it's that, it's that jerking of the leash, that shot collar, if you will, to be like, Joe, 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 Joe. Get, 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 get <laughs> Stay where I can see you. <laughs> exactly. Um, before I let you go, um, as we've been doing this the last couple of weeks, um, as I said, we had like 84 days to the election. Um, it feels like five years. <laughs> anyway, um, we've been doing our... It's, that's, it's uh, 864 days. Yeah, in, some um, shit. Yeah. In, in, in COVID time. In COVID time, right. So we, we've been doing our... Um, percent of chances of uh, Trump getting reelected based on the weekly behavior. Um, so far, nothing uh, out of the, over the top this week so far. But of course, the week is young. So last time we were on the, on the podcast last week, I think you had Trump at 47%. That was down from 52%. Um, I had Trump at 40% chance of getting reelected, up from 35% actually. So... Um, Mark, where are you I'll at amend now? that. I'll amend that down to forty-four percent chance that the president is reelected. Is that because of Kamala? I think. Uh, I, I think Senator Harris does a lot to unify the campaign and demonstrate is sort of address that elephant in the room of we know like demo, it. So it sort of feels like the DNC saying we hear you on the primary process and. We recognize the lack of enthusiasm surrounding the candidate at the top of the ticket being a 78-year-old white guy Mm -hmm. with a potentially problematic record around sexual assault and what have you. Um, This is an acknowledgement that all of those sort of countervailing arguments that have been had since uh, since Joe Biden has become the presumptive nominee, that People are seen, people are heard, and that um, this is going to be an inclusive administration constructed around a healing narrative. Yeah, so you have 44%. Um, I'm going to actually go down to also to 38%, down 2%. Um, <laughs> It's like drawing straws here, pretty much. <laughs> you know? So uh, let, me, let me ask you a question, you know. Do you feel, you know, obviously Joe Biden was sort of somebody who appeals naturally to the swing states, Mm -hmm. hearing some of the arguments on both sides that I've presented and knowing, you know, the the, the limited amount that you do know about the senator. How do you feel about um, about uh, obviously you've amended your your pick on the the reelection down, but sort of getting into the semi granular where are you on the senator and what she brings to the campaign? Well, I think she, again, she appeals to moderates. Again, I said earlier, you know, by being, you know, pro law enforcement, that's going to be key here. Cause that's one of the biggest, biggest narratives of, of this election is, you know, po- the police, defund the police, defund the police. And, you know, Joe Biden's already said, despite what Donald Trump has said, you know, to his supporters, 
Joe Biden has never never said. In fact, he's against the the police. He's been very, very. He's been very straight he's about that. He's been vehement, vehemently. In opposed, fact, as you know, to, to the supporters of this podcast, he's pissed off the left as a result. Okay, you can't play yeah. both ways. You can't just call Joe Biden some socialist demagogue when he's when, when he's pissing off the, the people who actually want some socialist uh, ideas. <laughs> you can't play both ways, and this is, that's not the way it works. Um, and I think, you know, even though what you said about the you know, Senator Harris having a little bit more progressive record than we give her credit for, I do think that that's actually a healthy balance of, of that could probably, if, if there are folks on the, say, the Bernie bro side that are willing to look at some of the facts and some of the things she has done as a, as a quote unquote progressive, that might lean them in to vote for Biden Harris. Same with the. Folks that are never Trumpers, uh, you know, independents, MPAs, um, Republicans who don't want Trump to win, she can get some of those of those that coalition there too, also, and that's enough to to win the win. But again, Donald Trump is still Donald Trump is still is still tough. He's going to fight us to fight us to, to, to the nail. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the you know the we we talked before sort of about the. Teflon, if you will, that surrounds Joe Biden regarding sort of some of the go to playbook attacks connected to uh, racism, xenophobia and misogyny that have come out of the GOP pretty consistently since uh, Barack Obama's campaign in 2008 Mm -hmm. up and down the ballot. The, the, The fear I have is that some of those attacks against the senator will will stick at least within within some independent circles. Um, but as the administration continues to shirk the advice of public health officials and doctors regarding COVID, uh, continu- continues to stand behind people like Mitch McConnell and their support of um, of liability protections for employers who would send employees back to work in unsafe conditions as all these things continue to impact our economy. Um, I got to believe that in battleground states and even in traditionally red states, they're going to start to look a whole lot more magenta and the sheer optics and, and visibility of a person of color, a woman of color on the ticket is going to pre- present a uh, a big impact on ballot. All right, yeah, that's, that's a good explanation there. So we'll see how it goes, though. But we officially, we officially have a race now. <laughs> VP VP yeah. uh, Harris yeah, we, and Biden. We got the conventions conventions just around the corner. I think the Dems are next week, and uh, the Republicans the week thereafter. All digital, right? Yeah. To, to, to the so best of weird. my knowledge. It's gonna be weird. I'm actually a fan of watching those conventions too. This is gonna be weird. Very, and well, and you know, don't don't discount to the debate that's happening with the administration relative to the Department of Education as as we approach the fall, and uh, you know, as we in in the next week or two, as children are due back to return oh, to yeah. school and the, the 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 war that's being waged on that. Betsy the, DeVos the, the could be an ap- Betsy DeVos could be an absolute. Uh, could be the reason Trump is his election. She's a, she's a serious she's a serious uh, amount of dead weight and yeah. and and a drag on the Trump administration's hopes for re-election. Yeah, especially now with the uh, school situation. Like I'm starting my kids at home first, so. Yeah, and this this shit in Georgia with students being suspended for bringing light to horrific situations. Uh, you know, school nurses and teachers quitting their jobs in, in, in various southern states where governors are echoing the president. It's uh it's it's really ugly. It's really, really ugly. All right. All right. Well, Mark, again, the week in a row, man. It's good. Get used to this. Yeah, I know. We got it's and I don't I don't imagine the pace is uh is gonna slow down anytime soon with the well, uh, with the conventions around yeah, the corner. So and again we'll react to the conventions next week probably. So Mark, we'll talk soon. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you.